for coming. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a delight to be uh, with you. Thank you to Conter and to Haven Right Center for, the, for organizing this uh, event. And it's a real pleasure to share a panel with David. Now the topic is um, extremely relevant and um, I will come to the point straight away. I don't think it's the end of neoliberalism, but it certainly is a point of inflection um, in the, of, of neoliberalism. And I want to explain how that is, how I think that is. Now, that it is a point of inflection became clear in the pandemic crisis. But really the process began uh, in full earnest with the great crisis of 2007, 2009. Um, the pandemic crisis incidentally, um, it is peculiar because I've said it before, but I'll say it again. It's, it's not endogenous to capitalist accumulation. It's unusual in this respect, and I will say more about it. But it certainly is endogenous to capitalist relations, capitalist social relations, to relations of uh, public health, to uh, interactions with nature, and to state power. Now, what's um, crucial in this period and constitutes the point of inflection of neoliberalism, I think, is that um, the state has emerged in an unprecedented way uh, in contemporary capitalism. I think in the history of capitalism, really, if you, if you look at the development of capitalism since the days of mercantilism, several centuries ago, the role of the state today is, is unprecedented. Um, in the West, not in China, but in the West, this uh, power of the state derives largely from control over fiat money. And I will explain how that is. Um, the implication is of the emergence of the state is crucial for the struggle for global hegemony as well. So it isn't simply a point of inflection for neoliberalism domestically. This is also a point of inflection for the global hegemonic struggle, fundamentally between the USA and China. Now, Let's get a little bit more um, concrete about this. Basically, we've got to look uh, at what happened after 2007, 2009. And as was already mentioned in the introduction, we had a period of relative stagnation. The, that the decade of the 2010s was basically a decade of relative uh, stagnation. And it's very easy to establish that. I won't bother you with uh, that data, although I'll show you some later. Uh, it's basically been a period of very weak investment across the core countries uh, of Western capitalism. And that has gone with very weak productivity growth. I want to stay here for a minute because weak productivity growth has been characteristic of the period of neoliberal dominance and in particular financialization of the last few decades. Uh, I say this because um, heterodox thinking and Marxist thinking it's just started to realize the significance of that. We're used to talking about capitalism increasing productivity. It does, but it does a differential pace uh, in different periods of time. And the last four decades have been pe a period of weak growth of productivity, relatively speaking, and the last decade, appalling, appalling. Productivity uh, really stagnated. But if there's no productivity growth, profitability will be weak. So the weakness of profitability uh, during the last decade is connected to weak productivity growth. And that is the foundation of the weakness of production and the supply side about which everyone uh, talks about. You can see it, as I say, in weak profitability and weak uh, productivity growth. At the same time, big businesses, large corporates, the big monopolies that uh, control the, the dominant economies and the world market, they've been awash with money awash with liquid resources available for short-term placement. In that context, the period after the great crisis has seen a readjustment of financialization, which is very important to, for understanding where we are at the moment and where neoliberalism is going. In what way? Let me say a few things more about finance, because that's very important. Characteristic of the last 10 years since the great crisis, has been a, a weakening of bank profitability. Big banks 
have not been as profitable as before. The golden era of um, uh, financial profits for banks, uh, fundamentally, that we saw in the 90s and 2000s came to an end. Banks made substantial profits, but there was no dynamic uh, 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 of increase. Uh, at the same time, banks faced controls, especially in the United States, big banks. There, there was an element of, um, of, of, re of re regulation. So the result was that debt did not increase as rapidly in that decade as before. Profit uh, financialization went, at, was at the crossroads. Uh, it basically uh, went at, 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 at so didn't march on. Um, while this was happening, and the big banks were facing this uh, predicament, shadow banking, shadow finance expanded. So with the readjustment uh, of the financial system and a readjustment of financialization. Now, what is shadow banking? Shadow banking is very important today. Um, it's basically an enormous range of institutions, a vast fauna of financial intermediaries uh, who are less, uh, less severely regulated. Uh, and that's saying something um, than big banks. They are uh, an enormous feature of capitalism today. Basically, investment funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, uh, exchange traded funds, and a vast array of these things, um, which um, have become incredibly prominent in contemporary capitalism uh, and dictate much of uh, economic uh, life. What are these people? Portfolio managers. That's basically what they are. They're basically portfolio managers. They're basically people who collect money from um, large numbers of other institutions and place them uh, on the stock market. That continued to expand in the previous decade. They became more and more powerful. Financialized capitalism came to be dominated and shaped by these people. And when I say dominated and shaped, I just want to give you a piece of evidence to see what shaping means. Right now, three index funds, so-called, in other words, BlackRock, Vanguard, and um, State Street Global Advisors, three of these shadow financiers control 20% of the entire stock of the US economy, everything. 20% of the shares belong, are controlled by these people. Such concentration of um, wealth and property is unprecedented. There's every prospect that if it continues that way, they might control 50% uh, of the entire stock of um, uh, uh, US economy, all, all the shares of the US economy uh, in the period ahead. These people, that kind of outfit, that kind of rebalancing of financialization, I repeat, while banks have been marking time, was also behind uh, international finance. It's these people who are behind global flows. It is these people who are investing um, in developing countries and buying securities and trading in securities and managing portfolio uh, abroad. What is behind these transformations? Why has the supply side been so weak? We've seen. Uh, what explains um, the transformation of um, finance? The state. The state has been crucial to this. Without the state, it wouldn't have happened uh, in that way. The state has been pivotal. It's been pivotal, first of all, in terms of what it did uh, with money. Monetary policy, since the great crisis of 2007-2009, uh, has been incredible. Interest rates have, been, have come down to zero, close to zero. The central bank has provided enormous liquidity and the state has been acquiring debt. Debt like the uh, issue in debt, debt like there's no tomorrow. I'll show you some evidence uh, of, of this uh, in a minute. The reason why it's been able to do it is because of course the state controls the final means of payment, fiat money created by the central bank. Now it's been doing that in the sphere of money and finance to support financialization and to promote the transformation of financialization. The shadow banking and shadow institutions that I mentioned would have been unthinkable without the sustained support of the central bank and that kind of monetary policy uh, operated by powerful states. At the same time during the previous decade, big states engaged in austerity. Fiscal policy was the opposite, tight, no spending, imposed the costs on working people, um, cut public expenditure, Britain was one of the worst cases of this, um, but elsewhere in Europe and elsewhere in other developed countries, uh, the same thing. 
Now, in 2019, then, when the pandemic hit, it found a supply side weak, as I've explained. The financial side transformed in favor of shadow banks and engaging in securities speculation, and the state engaging in these complex activities with regard to monetary policy. Then comes the hit. The exogenous shock of um, the disease. The response of big states was extraordinary. Shut down enormous, shut down economies, shut down enormous uh, cities, urban centers, not confront the disease as it should have been done with a policy to support uh, the interests of workers and, and others, but shut down in, uh, in entire vast uh, uh, metropolis and so on. Once the nature of the crisis that began to emerge became clear, once they realized that this was creating a disaster, then the state reversed policy. And the, reverse, the reversal of policy in, in economics was incredible. In monetary policy, they did pretty much what they did before, only more so. I'll show you that in a minute. The real transformation was in fiscal policy. Unlike the previous decade, what the states, the, the major states of the world did was to engage in tremendous fiscal expansion, no austerity this time. They showed that neoliberalism and austerity and austerity don't necessarily go together. Those who identify neoliberalism with austerity need to rethink. Neolib neoliberalism is about other things, not simply austerity, um, which I will point out in a minute. The state reversed policy uh, and began to spend money on incredible things. Partial nationalization of the wage bill. They began to support wages. Partial support of households, a kind of basic income was provided to people for periods of time, a pandemic kind of basic income, especially in the United States. Um, partial partial uh, nationalization of the income statement of um, corporations, huge boost to aggregate demand altogether. Most of this support went to big business. Most of this support went to big business. What went to workers um, was meant to ameliorate the impact uh, of the crisis. Here is a little bit of evidence so that you don't think that I'm making this up as I'm going along. You will see here, I think you can, um, the magnitude of state expenditure when the pandemic crisis hit, the degree of public deficits um, brought to bear uh, as uh, states intervened uh, across the board, all five uh, major states. Now, the result of that was, of course, huge growth of public debt. Public debt increased even more than before. Same thing, but even more in terms of intervention in monetary policy. The trial run of 2007-2009 was repeated after the pandemic on steroids. What happened was, Interest rates were driven down to zero. Huge liquidity provision by the central bank through the repo market and so on. A huge acquisition of public debt and private debt by central banks. Central banks have now emerged as the preeminent public institution of contemporary capitalism. Central banks uh, are vast. They have engulfed the money market. The, pub, the, the financial system doesn't work with them. Um, and they've got power such as no financial institution um, has ever had before. This is public power because it rests, it rests on public credit used for private purposes, used to support um, private capital. That has been the response of the dominant countries in the West. And it's been a response calibrated to deal with the shock of the crisis and rescue a system that had been weak, as I've explained, and facing difficulties of accumulation. Compare that to China. China has been more successful in dealing with the crisis, no question about it. More successful in terms of the disease and its impact. I'm not defending the authoritarianism of the regime, please don't misunderstand me, I'm simply reading the results. Um, China has been far more successful in controlling the, uh, the disease, <laughs> but it's also been very different in terms of its economic activity. It has actually gone 
for supporting public investment and supporting enterprises uh, through a variety uh, of means. Why? Why has it been more successful? Uh, also being reflected in the economic results. Because the state in China owns resources. The state owns productive resources and the state owns banks. And therefore it's been able to intervene in this way. The state in the West has huge power, but this power exercised through financial markets and through um, uh, control over money. It's a very different, um, very different predicament. The state in China also is dominated by the Communist Party. Now the Communist Party is um, not a real Communist Party, but it's a vast mechanism which exercises controlling influence over much of the economy. So just one piece of evidence, all the, um, the, the chief executive offices of the large state operated enterprises in China belong to the economic uh, committee of the central committee of the Communist Party of China. So um, the state not only has command over resources, but it has command over the personnel that directly shapes the economy. This is very different. Um, uh, to what happened in Western countries. That is not to say that China doesn't face huge problems. It does. Chinese capitalism has enormous problems, but it's very different from the West. That is also the cause for what I mentioned before, the intensified struggle for hegemony. These two types of capitalism um, are competing. Um, the pandemic crisis and the period before has intensified this competition. That's what we're entering. We're entering a period in which the greater role of the state across the board leads, leads to intensification of the hegemonic struggle. And this struggle between China and the US, this time is actually for the first time since 1914, it is reminiscent of Lenin uh, in the sense that capitalist hegemonic struggle now comes from directly economic um, uh, causes. Until very recently, the hegemonic struggles we knew were mostly political and military. There was no way that the Soviet Union, for instance, could compete militarily with, uh, uh, economically with the United States. China is not like that. China competes economically and the military and political uh, contest uh, is connected to the uh, economic contest. In other words, there is no obvious point of equilibrium. The intensification of the hegemonic struggle across the world will not stop. Um, there is no obvious place uh, which it, it will come to an end. And that is, again, an outcome of uh, the transformation of financialization and of neoliberalism. So is this the end of neoliberalism then? Let me come to an end because I realize my time is, my time is coming up. Uh, no, it's too soon to say that. The state has emerged in an unprecedented way. I think we can talk about, uh, we can talk about state-based financialization now. Uh, however, there are significant elements which make us think that neoliberalism survives, survives, the, the core of neoliberalism survives. In other words, no challenge to private property in the West. There is no challenge to private property, they, despite the state intervention in the ways that are pointed out. No challenge, no, no challenge to private property. Public investment remains uh, uh, limited. There is no obvious uh, drive for uh, a massive wave of public investment, and obviously, uh, very little, next to nothing, has happened on labor rights. Uh, the balance between capital and labor in terms of rights and so on hasn't shifted in favor of, of, uh, of labor. State intervention has been uh, directed to rescuing capital and the transformation of neoliberalism has been aimed at sustaining uh, the power of the oligarchic elite that's, uh, that dominates the world. Now, what will happen is the question. Which way will we go? I've got two seconds to tell you that. Um, at the level of the enterprises, the difficulties of the production and the supply side that I mentioned both continue. That's the source of what's happening at the moment. People are, look at it amazed. Why isn't the supply side responding? Well, I, I wonder. I mean, profitability has been so weak and the investment has been so weak. Why is it so weak? Why, why is the response so weak? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a major mystery. Um, enterprises will, of course, move dynamically in the green field. There will be plenty of greenwashing uh, uh, in the period ahead. ahead. You, will, you won't have seen so many, very, so many capitalists keen on, uh, on, on, on greening the world uh, as before. There will also be a drive to, um, 
to, to introduce new technologies through digital, digitalization and so on. The impact on productivity and profitability remains to be seen. There is no evidence that we're gonna enter a new period or, 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 or on the supply side. On the aggregate, the, the demand side and the side of the state, much will depend on what will happen to debt. The United States at the moment has got debt at war levels. Uh, it's as if it's been fighting a, a world war and the only war it's been fighting is domestic. So uh, um, there's vast amounts of, of, of public debt, vast amounts of corporate debt and huge increase in the money supply. The boost to demand, given the supply is not functioning particularly well, leads to inflation. The, the threat of inflation is not insignificant. In this context, workers should defend their wages and income uh, in the period ahead. There should be no compromise there. So the period ahead looks difficult for working people. Uh, it looks very demanding for working people as contemporary capitalism faces this, um, this turmoil and transformation. The impact on democracy and political life uh, will not be positive. It's actually deeply problematic. Uh, Western capitalism and Western liberalism in particular is exhausted. Populism doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And there is a threat of fascism in this context. In other words, this is a kind of interregnum. The old refuses to die. The new cannot be born. A very dangerous time. That's why socialist ideas, fresh ideas based on Marxism are so important right now. Uh, an activity based on those ideas. It's the only hope for us, uh, and I would argue for humanity as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Costas. Can everyone do the virtual clap, clap? Thanks, I know. It can be slightly cringy sometimes, but thank you very much. There we are, all the claps, brilliant. Thank you, Costas. And you came in four minutes under. That, that's got to, be, got to be a first on, on the Zoom. I'll pass on to David now. Okay, can you uh, all hear me? Okay, good. All right. Um, so the question is, what's happening to neoliberalism? Well, it depends a bit on how you define neoliberalism. Uh, there are a fantastic number of books come out recently, which are redefining it and its history as an idea and its history as public policies and all the rest of it. And uh, that's not my definition of neoliberalism. My definition was that it was a class project by the, by the big corporations and the wealthy capitalist class to recuperate as much capital as they possibly could for themselves and to uh, advance their, their own position as, as a dominant class. That was what was set up in the 1970s. And the, I think initially when that was set up, it was not set up around uh, supply side economics or anything of that kind. They looked around for an economic justification for what they were doing and they found it. Uh, that's what uh, Friedman and Hayek gave them. And so it, the, the policies all sort of flowed secondary. And then the, the interesting thing is that I don't think Margaret Thatcher knew what neoliberalism was until Keith Joseph told her coming out of the Institute of Economic Affairs and she talked to Hayek and all of that. And then she thought, oh, well, that's a good idea. We'll go ahead with that. And of course, the, the interesting thing was it did not work in its pure form as, a, as an idea, as an economic uh, uh, set of policies. The same thing happened in Chile. Uh, initially, uh, neoliberalism was not what Pinochet was after. Uh, he only switched to that after the landed elite down in Chile, getting together with the Chicago economists, uh, persuaded uh, Pinochet to move in this direction of austerity, neoliberalism, and all the rest of it. So as a, as a set of ideas, uh, well, it, those ideas are still floating around and those policies are still floating around. But what is really crucial is to ask the question, what happened to the project to accumulate more and more wealth on the part of a smaller and smaller uh, elite. Well, let me just read you something uh, which was, came out of the Financial Times, uh, which talks about uh, uh, what happened during, during the coronavirus. Uh, and this is uh, from the FT. As the virus spread, central banks injected 9 trillion into economies worldwide, aiming to keep the world economy afloat. Much of that stimulus has gone into financial markets and from there into the net worth of the ultra-rich. 
The US Federal Reserve, for example, has put 8.1 trillion into the economy through quantitative easing, about one third of gross domestic product. The total wealth of billionaires worldwide rose by 5 trillion to 13 trillion in 12 months, the most dramatic increase ever registered. I mean, this is a, this is a phenomenal kind of uh, increase in wealth and you can then talk about the number of billionaires, a tremendous surge in the number of billionaires around the world, including in China, which got a billionaire every 36 hours. So that this whole kind of concentration, enormous concentration of economic and political power, which goes with it uh, amongst uh, an oligarchy has, has, has gone on apace. And yes, we've seen some sort of revival of uh, tepid tank Keynesianism, if you like, of redistributing. But in the United States, uh, the redistribution that uh, came to, to uh, the, the lower classes was worth about 700 million whereas the amount that went to the upper classes amounted to 10 trillion. So if the project were, if the neoliberalism as a project is about accumulating more and more wealth and privilege and power in a small oligarchic elite, then the answer is that has not gone away. It's that well and, and, and truly uh, on, uh, pushing, pushing forward. Uh, and uh, Secondly, just uh, looking at this in terms of uh, policies, and look at somebody like Trump, who's considered not to be neoliberal in the classic kind of sense, but his uh, tax reform, which gave everything to the corporations and, and to the elite and, and put the US into more deficit by about $1.6 trillion or something of that kind, that was a pure neoliberal uh, passage. Uh, and one of the things that happened, of course, with neoliberalism back in the 1990s was it began to lose its... its uh, uh, legitimacy, uh, that uh, it had got where it got largely by consent. Uh, by the 1990s, the consent started to wear a bit thin, and in the 2000s, it, it went very thin, and so it, it linked up in the United States with neoconservatism, so neoliberalism was the carrot and the, the neocons gave you the big stick, which was, in a sense, an authoritarian basis for, for, for what the neoliberal project was about. Now, the policy stuff is going all over the place. It goes this way and that way, and austerity was one of the good things. But clearly, it was austerity for the working people and not austerity for the corporations. So, the, 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 so these are the sorts of uh, things that exist in the past. So my answer to the question, is neoliberalism still with us? The answer is yes, the project is still on. It's going very strong. It's stronger than it's ever been. And this is something that we really have to be able to con confront uh, very, very seriously. Now, having said that, I think there's a, there are a number of other issues which, uh, which uh, are associated with it. And I, and I want to go back a bit, if you like, to 2007, 2009, the crisis that really sort of started to mess with uh, a lot of the things that were going on in, in the world. So the 2007, 2009, how did, how, how did capital get out of that crisis? Well, there was an attempt through uh, public expenditures to do a sort of uh, uh, stimulus and so on. But in the United States, that was very tepid. Uh, everybody recognized afterwards it was not the stimulus was not sufficiently strong was not sufficiently powerful uh, to be able to get out of the crisis uh, and many other countries stuck with their austerity even in the midst of crisis which was a crazy thing to do there was some agreement for the g20 after the in crisis initially broke out that there would be a global attempt to, to bring it back into get capital back on on track uh, it didn't last very long. Uh, in fact, uh, the first meeting showed some consensus. The second meeting was all over the place, and so there was no... Uh, so how did capital get out of the crisis of 2007-2008? Because one of the theses that I work with a lot is that how you get out of a crisis at a particular moment in time defines where the next crisis is going to come from. So it's very important to look at 2007-2009 as to how capital got out of it. And the answer was very simple. It was China, China, China. China brought capital out of a crisis 2007, 2009. And it did so because China's export market to the United States collapsed. And bankruptcies were going on all over China in 2007, 2008. It was, it was, it was catastrophic. 
there were there were tales that perhaps China lost as many as 30 million jobs in about one and a half years. And if there's one thing the Communist Party is terrified of, it's of mass unemployment of that kind. So it lost 30 million jobs in the export of goods to the United States, and something had to be done about it. Now, there was an IMF report came out about a year or so later and said, well, what's the, what was the net job loss through the 2007, 2009? And they said, well, the United States lost something like 14 million jobs. That was the net job loss. China only lost 3 million. So if it had lost 3 mil 30 million to start with, and it ended up with a net job loss of, of 3 million, it had somehow or other created something like 27 million jobs in one year. Now, this is something astonishing. This is really, really astonishing to, to create that, that, that number of jobs in that, that time. Now, for me, and with my interest in urbanization and even geographical development, I immediately ask is, well, how the hell did they do it? What did they do? And in what ways was, was that employment directed to, 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 to address what kinds of problems? Well, the answer was almost all of it was, was redirected into urbanization and property development and infrastructure development. China in 2008 had zero miles of high speed rail network. Within 10 years, it had 20,000 miles. It built 20,000 miles of high speed rail network in, 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 in about seven or eight years. Again, astonishing performance. It started to build whole cities. It started to build again all over the place in, 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 in a massive thing. Now, China actually, since 2008, has been at the center of what economic growth there has been. About 28% of growth of GDP, global GDP since 2008 is attributable to China alone, which is far more than the United States and Europe contributed. So that China, in a sense, was, 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 defining, was defining where global capitalism was going because that urbanization project exercised a huge amount of demand for, for new uh, for, for resources in particular. So, you know, Chile sent the copper, Brazil was sending the iron ore, Australia was sending things. So the Chinese uh, were, were actually saving global capitalism by this vast investment, by this vast uh, uh, investment in, 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 in reconstruction of the built environment. Now, this is nothing, nothing new, actually. Uh, and, and I was I kind of look at this and say, well, you know, this is exactly what Louis Bonaparte did in Paris in sort of 1852. He brought house money in to rebuild the city and create full employment and construction and all the rest of it, which he did. And that, that, that stabilized the thing. But the, the, if you like, the, what, what happened in, in, in Paris was minuscule compared to this huge, huge uh, impact. Now, if China has accounted for 28%, 28% of that 28% is in one thing alone, which is housing. That is, they're producing housing like crazy. Now, if you're, this is a form of, of, of investment in fixed capital, and it's also a form of investment in what Marx calls the consumption fund. And, and generally speaking, the idea about fixed, in, fixed capital is that you invest in fixed capital to increase productivity. But Marx has something interesting. He says, in the face of a falling rate of profit, maybe one of the things you should do is not invest in anything that is actually going to improve productivity. You need to find ways of investing which do not have a positive effect upon productivity, because the growth of productivity is what is lying behind a falling rate of profit. So one of the things to do was to start to invest in things which had zero impact on productivity. Well, one of the ways you could do that is to is to start then to 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 look look for a, a vast wave of investment in in the built environment, and and it, you know on the ground what you see is crazy, insane urbanization going on. We have it in New York City. We're building out the zoo, uh, all kinds of things are for the for the for the upper classes at the same time as we've got a crisis of affordable housing. And if you look at the urbanization in the Gulf states and you look at the urbanization in China and you look at urbanization processes all around, what you see is a massive amount of, 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 of wealth 
which is being accumulated in by, by, by financial institutions and so on, flowing into the built environment. But if you're going to invest in the built environment, then you need to have financial institutions which allow you to do it. Now, one of the things that we've got to do with, the, I, I sort of turn this thing around. It was actually the investment in the built environment that forced the Chinese to start to modify their financial institutions. This had been true in Paris, in Second Empire Paris. When Haussmann came to power, he didn't have the kinds of credit institutions which could support the, both the production and the consumption of the new housing that was going to be built. So he, he tagged up with a couple of bankers, the Perrier brothers, and they set up the credit immobilier or the credit mobilier in order to be able to create the financing which would allow for the urbanization project to proceed. In other words, the urbanization project came first, the financialization work came along after it. And I think that what in the Chinese case, the Chinese had very weak financial institutions because they'd all been dismantled in the Cultural Revolution. So in 1978, hardly anybody knew what banking was supposed to be about. But so, so China went into a kind of a wild west of financial innovation with wealth management products and, and the like. Uh, and, and of course, the state owned banks were also there. But a lot of the finance of, of, all, of all, all of this urbanization was out, out of the, sh the shadow banking uh, sector rather than the, the, the main banking sector. The main banking sector usually would intervene in the shadow banking sector when the shadow banking sector got into a mess. So China had to create institutions because, for example, they didn't have a mortgage system up until about 1990. And now they have to create something like a mortgage system so people could buy some of these, 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 these uh, apartments that have been built. The result is that a vast amount of uh, accumulation in China has ended up in the built environment and, and in a sense is a chronic overproduction. Right now, the estimate is that there's something like 30 million vacant apartments or vacant dwellings in China. Okay, 30 million. Now, if you say, well, three, three persons per apartment, that's saying that's accommodation of about 90 million people, which is more than more, slightly more than the whole total population of Germany, about or equal the total population of Turkey. In other words, what we're looking at in this Chinese case is a shift in scale of what is going on, which is so completely dramatic and it moves so fast. One of the things I learned on my visits to China is that every year I would go there and the whole thing would be completely different. Everything, I mean, first year I'm there, I, could, I just, you know, would, would pay for my coffee with money. By the third year I'm there, almost everybody is paying, you know, is, the cash has almost disappeared. I mean, it's become an almost a cashless economy, which was great for me because I didn't have a credit card, so everybody had to buy me coffee. And so, so it was a, but things changed there very fast. The first year I was in Nanjing, they were talking about they didn't like the downtown and were going to re-engineer it. The second year I'm there, they flattened a lot of land and they've got a couple of spectacular pieces of architecture by Adid or something. And the third year I'm there, the whole thing is damn well built. And this is like this is like the you know again this is you're dealing with something here which is chronically different from anything that we've ever experienced and ever thought about and i want i want to emphasize that and this has really absolutely nothing to do with neoliberalism except that the number of billionaires in china has escalated and the inequalities have escalated immensely and and and, and as i said during the the, the virus uh, China got 626 more billionaires. It's very close to the number of billionaires that, that have. So there's a billionaire class, which is emerged, emerged in, in China. And what you'll see right away is the Communist Party is now very nervous about these guys. It picks them up and it puts them in bars and uh, behind bars for a bit or, uh, and is terrorizing them in some ways. But also, we're starting to see this huge uh, shift in, in China's economy. China's economy rested up until 2007, 2008 on cheap labor. It was a labor intensive industrialization and that was its big comparative advantage in global trade. When the crash came 2008, a, a, a lot of that disappeared and it has not recuperated. The Chinese now have a project to move towards a capital intensive economy 
uh, one with high productivity and, and, and a lot of artificial intelligence and all those kinds of things. And, and you, you, this is where the United States uh, is, is, is getting in because the United States was very liberal about technology transfer to Japan, very liberal about technology transfer to South Korea, to Taiwan and all the rest of it. But at, at the same time has been trying to stop technology transfer to China. Well, this is, this is an insane project because look at a company like Foxconn. Foxconn makes your Apple computers. Foxconn employs about maybe 200 or 300,000 people in Shenzhen alone. It's a Taiwanese company. It's a Taiwanese company that has all of the data about you know, what goes on inside of Apple computers and all the rest of it and manufactures them in China. You can't stop the technology transfer going on because the Taiwanese have huge interests in, in, in China. Taiwan has the, is if you like an intermediary, Hong Kong is another intermediary, then technology transfer is going on all of the time. And by the way, the Chinese, in the same way that they can build high speed network of trade and all the trains and all the rest of it, they're, they're, they're able to really be well advanced now in terms of artificial intelligence. In fact, the, the suggestion is in some of the literature that they're way ahead of the United States in, 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 in AI, partly because the, 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 the resource you need for AI is, is, is data and China can collect the data and this idea of personal defense of you know, your own data and all of that, that's out of the window with China. So, so they, they have a tremendous comparative advantage in many respects right now in terms of artificial intelligence and the like. And they could well be pushing uh, ahead in, in that area, far ahead of, uh, of the United States. So here's, here's then the, 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 the situation in which, again, during, the, during the, 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 the COVID virus pandemic, which is, which is still with us, China has managed to organize itself very, very well and very quickly with it. But the, more importantly, I think, is the transformation in the economy that China is now in, 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 if you use purchasing power parity, China now has by far the largest economy in the world. In conventional kind of uh, measures, it, it, it doesn't, so it, it's number two. But still, being number two and very close to the United States in conventional measures, but in purchasing power parity, it's, 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 it's way ahead. So, what is it, so if you ask me what's going to happen in the next few years, I'm going to say it all depends on China. And one thing I know about China is that whatever you say about it this year is completely outdated by next year. It is dynamic. It is, it is operating at a scale which is something which is un, unbelievable. It is therefore something which, which this I, these questions about neoliberalism and so on just don't really enter in. Yes, the, the market kind of works for the private sector. And it's very interesting because the state owned enterprises, if you look at the investment structures, the state owned enterprises move in a contracyclical way to the private enterprises. The private enterprises go into a slump and the state enterprises go up. So it's, 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 it's a managed economy and a managed economy on, on their own, own particular principles. And their own particular principles are of course, very much about trying to maintain a political control and political control means control, creating employment and 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 dealing with uh, the global economy in in, a, in 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 fresh ways because China is now losing its main historical advantage, which was a, a vast untapped labor supply. In fact, the one-child policy, which has been operating since about 1980 means that actually the young people in China are now, there's, a, there's a, a pyramid now, way, way down. And in fact, they got a, tried to get out of the one child policy about two years ago, then they went to a three child policy. But women by and large don't want to have kids, it turns out in China. And so there's not been very much response in terms of the demographics. And this is again, one of the key things which Marx points out all of the time that there is a real key association between the growth, continuous growth of capital, the endless accumulation of capital and the labor supply. In the past, that labor supply has been furnished by 
exponential growth rates in population. Well, now we have negative growth rates in about 50 countries around the world. That has come to an end. And China is interesting right now because it does not have the labor supply that it had, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago. So it has therefore to move to a much more capital intensive economy if it's to maintain its position in, in, in the world. And, and all this stuff that is going on in, you know, in the United States and everywhere, what to do about, you know, get this going or that going, is, is, is essentially, as far as I see it, is peanuts compared to what's happening there. Their, the growth of their financial system has, has, has been a real, a real problem. It's, it's, like I said, it's Wild West. They have all of these kind of wealth management project, products, many of which gone belly up. They're little Ponzi schemes. Yeah, okay. Five minutes, thank right. you. They, they have many of these things. So, so I'm sorry if I'm talking a lot about China, but I think that actually we've got to pay attention to this. And big, the big problem in the United States, of course, and possibly, I don't know if it's quite so true in Britain, but in the United States, the hostility to China and the inability to talk about what the hell is happening in China is, 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 is obviously becoming a chronic, chronic. Sort of, sort, of, sort of issue. And this idea which the neocons had in the 1990s that they were not only going to take down Saddam, they were going to take down China as well. This, that idea that you can take China down is, 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 is really, really dangerous because I think the Chinese see what is going on. They know what's going on. They're even investing more and more in, in, in military equipment and sophisticated military equipment at the same time. So this is a, a very dangerous, dangerous situation where we're in, in part because of the inability of people in the United States or elsewhere or in the West to appreciate exactly what is happening in China and what has happened. All they get are the negative stories coming out. And yes, there are some, but we've got plenty of our own negative stories if you want to do that. So this is, this is something which I really think we really ought to do. And the Chinese have no interest whatsoever in this debate over neoliberalism and its future, but they do have to deal with the tremendous concentration of wealth which is occurring in their oligarchy. Uh, the number of billionaires in China, and that is something which is going to be dealt with politically, seems to be being dealt with politically, and we're beginning to find that the Chinese, yes, they have a huge indebtedness, but one of the great things about them is they're indebted in their own currency. Therefore, they can you know, they can't they can't go bankrupt in their own currency, and 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 their indebtedness to the rest of the world is relatively shallow, so they can they can get away with this. And but I just want to make one comment about indebtedness. I read the other day that we're all indebted up to the tune of something like every man, woman, and child on this 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 planet is is indebted up to the level of something like eighty thousand dollars. But the thing about debt is it uh, is owed to somebody. And I'm in a personal situation where I have a pension fund, which is positive, so I'm a creditor. I have a mortgage and I'm a debtor. What prevents me from taking my pension fund and, and, and retiring my mortgage is simply that the tax organization is such as to make it uh, uh, impos almost impossible and make, makes no economic sense to, to do that. So we're all indebted uh, at the same time as, as we were all creditors. So, so it's not as if we're indebted to Mars. You know, if we were indebted to Mars, we'd be in real trouble. But we're not. We're indebted to ourselves, and so the whole the whole thing can be unwound pretty easily. By I could I could go into a negative kind of situation by if if I could take my uh, pension fund, which is and not be penalised and retire my mortgage debt, then a lot of this kind of indebtedness would disappear. I'm indebted to myself, which is a ridiculous kind of situation. But that's the kind of thing that has, has emerged with this financialization. But I'm very uh, interested in this whole idea of investment in the built environment, investment, investment in fixed capital, uh, and investment in the consumption fund, and particularly uh, in, of, of an independent kind. That, that, that is what has been driving a lot of what has been going on, particularly in China. And it, so far, it has kept the capitalist economy globally uh, alive. If, if it gets into real difficulties, then I think we'll see the problems. Okay, that's me for now. Thanks, David. We'll just take a moment to virtually clap. Yeah, thank you very much. We're gonna move on to um, questions now. I also invite um, Costas and David to 
comment on each other's points um, when they're also answering the questions, if there's things that you want to cost us, for example. Um, there's two ways to ask questions, one in the chat. Oh, we've got people already getting their hands up. For those who don't know how to virtually raise your hand, you go and click reactions, and then there's a little uh, a hand emoji that you click. Um, I'm gonna take three at a time. This round, I'm gonna do two um, virtual hands and one from the chat. I'll start with a previous question that's for Costas, and it's from Ian, who says, wasn't a more typical endogenous crisis building anyway, and then exacerbated by COVID. As I've seen argued by Michael Roberts, I'd be interested to hear if Costas agrees or disagrees with that. Um, I'm going to now take Fu, Fu, and I, I would invite folk to be as succinct as possible because we've got nearly 500 um, attendees here and we want to hear from as many folk as possible. Fu. Um, very quickly, to everyone really, if the future were Chinese, is there anything for us to worry about? Now, I don't think that we need to stop at simply saying that the future will be Chinese. I think we can go on further than that because people should know that uh, the Kennedy Harvard Center reports 40,000 incidents of protests, many of them successful strikes. The Public Security Bureau, when they arrested two, um, um, two activists, reported that there were 70,000 protests over three years. So the working class there is well and alive, and they started protesting really, really quickly after the, um, after the pandemic. And you know, it's, it's, it's continuing. So I just want to say that I don't think there's anything to worry about, but I don't think that you know, that is the end of the story, that if the future was Chinese. And if in these two competitive systems, I would like to say that I think that Hong Kong is forever part of China, I'm completely opposed to Joe Biden or Trump humiliating Chinese government, but I have no problem with Chinese people in Hong Kong humiliating the Chinese government. I have to go, I'll get your answers very um, later um, in, the, in, the, in, in the recording. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fu. Yes, just a reminder that there will be a recording on the Contour and Havens Right Center. Um, Ilhan, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Would you like to pose your question? Yeah, can you hear me? It's a little I bit. Hope you can hear me. Hand. Yes, give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. Ilhan, Ilhan, your connections. I'm afraid your connections are unstable. Could you please put your um, question into the chat, and we'll circle back to it. Okay. You won't be missing. Okay, so we'll go move on to. Could someone uh, please mute Ilhan? Ilhan, if you put your question in the chat, we'll be sure to pick it up. Samuel. Uh, I have to. Okay. Samuel. Samuel, we can't we can't hear you. I'll come if you can Hello. put your oh. ah there we are. Great, Sorry. thank you. Fire ahead. There were some problems, some technical problems. Um, I just would like to uh, greetings for from Colombia, South America, and um, I would like to know uh, what about what about land ownership on and neoliberalism in uh, in this time. I would like to know. Uh, what happens with uh, with what happened with land owner ownership in Africa and other and other countries, uh, mainly um, third world countries? Okay, thank you, Samuel. And I suppose that's to both both speakers. So, Costas, I'll invite you to come in first. Thank you. Um, was there going to be a crisis anyway? I mean, what can I say? What, what kind of statement is that? It's like, I mean, I just, 
that's just an assertion um, of the most extraordinary kind that seems to want to prove that some version one has in one's mind about how the crisis, capitalism works, will be proven right, whatever. I said, in 2019, the global capitalist system, particularly the core of it, was in a weak state. Yeah, there was no serious overexpansion of finance. Elements of it were overexpanded. The real overexpansion happened in 2020. Now you've got a bubble, which has been manufactured by the state through its intervention in, uh, in the pandemic. In 2019, some elements of finance were overextended. Some elements of shadow finance were uh, exposed to speculation, ETFs in particular, and they paid the price. But would there have been a crisis anyway? <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of statement is that? All we can say is that the, it's, we, the system was weak when it was impacted by, by coronavirus um, and then state intervention, it careered into an unprecedented crisis. In short, the state created the 2020 crisis um, through shutting down aggregate demand and through disrupting ag aggregate supply to confront the virus. Could it have done it differently? Yes. The reason why it responded in that way is because it's a neoliberal state of a particular type. It defends the interests of certain oligarchies and it chose to do what it understood. It was unprepared and it chose to intervene in the way in which it did. Now, China and the USA. <clears throat> Let me say the outset. China has got little to do with neoliberalism. Uh, China can be understood as a, an alternative case. Indeed, very important. That's why the competition at the moment, the hegemonic struggle is very important um, because what we see in the West is an incredible role for the state. It's been catapulted to the, to the forefront uh, through the crisis of 2007, 2009 and the pandemic crisis, unprecedented. Um, um, based on fiat money, I repeat, based on control over um, money which is ultimately public and used to serve the interests uh, of, of, of an oligarchy. Uh, those states remain very powerful. The United States is not going to be an easy competitor uh, for China. It's obvious. The United States uh, elite has realized that it made a mistake um, the way it uh, approached uh, China and it's not going to allow China to um, compete uh, globally, that's why we can uh, expect uh, essentially imperialist struggles uh, across the world ahead. It's very dangerous. This is the most dangerous moment in uh, in global um, military and political affairs in a very long time. Now, for China itself, the crucial thing here is uh, state presence in the economy, state-operated enterprises are the backbone of the Chinese economy. Public uh, 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 financial institutions are the backbone of the financial system. Um, they don't operate in a public way particularly, they operate capitalistically uh, and, and privately, but the state and the communist party is behind them and that is of crucial importance. Shadow banking, the way the Chinese talk about it, is not shadow banking in the way of the West. Um, it's just banking, uh, lending to enterprises uh, away from the uh, uh, public banks, for the publicly owned banks. It's not shadow finance the way we know it. It's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, investment funds and so on, uh, on remotely the same scale uh, as in the West. And I repeat, when you look at that, you realize the difference. I said it, and I'll say it again. Three index funds right now in the United States control 20% of the entire stock of US capitalism, three of them. And soon they might control 40 or 45% if, if, if current trends continue. These are asset managers. They don't get involved in um, the running of the enterprises, they're portfolio managers. Um, and uh, they've got an incredible position in, uh, uh, in, in financial markets and they're sustained by the Federal Reserve um, and uh, uh, and the state generally, similar things are happening in Europe. Similar things are happening in Europe with different um, uh, institutional uh, uh, aspects. Now, is this the end of neoliberalism? No, it's a transformation of neoliberalism in the West confronted with this behemoth in, in China, which has indeed rescued the economy in the previous decade by uh, through investment in um, infrastructure uh, and housing. One thing I will mention here though, we looked recently, 
my colleagues and I, we looked recently at the rate of profit, the rate of return of state operated enterprises in China. It's been, it's been declining non, nonstop throughout the last decade. In other words, the productive machine in China is also hitting the buffers. So that will make the contest uh, even more severe. That's what I expect to see uh, in the time ahead as Western neoliberalism readjusts. As for land ownership, I don't really know much about land ownership in Africa. Um, maybe uh, David is more uh, familiar with it. Um, what I do want to say is that land ownership in the context of China is very important. Um, the way presumably public ownership of land has been tweaked and manipulated to allow precisely this kind of speculation in real estate that uh, has been mentioned before by getting access to licenses to allow the speculators um, to build uh, on land. Land remains a major uh, instrument of enrichment and it remains also uh, a, key, um, a key mechanism for profit extraction through, um, through um, the, uh, the asset managers that I mentioned previously, through the, uh, the index funds and the real estate funds uh, in the West. That's all I've got to say. Thanks, Costas. David, would you like to comment on any of the questions posed? Yeah, well, on the, the land ownership, uh, yeah, China is interesting. The main form of local finance is by land sales, and they haven't yet gone to a property tax, but they are likely to do so in the near future. Um, but uh, land ownership uh, has become critical in many parts of the world. and. For, for example, my own pension fund uh, has been heavily involved in what's called land grabbing in Latin America, because this is where the rate of return is highest for the pension fund. And so I, I complain about the, what the pension fund is doing uh, in terms of uh, taking up the land, but uh, speculating on, on land ownership and property ownership is a, is a very big uh, part of what, what is going on contemporaneously. My, my bet noir is uh, Blackstone, uh, of all people. I mean, Blackstone went, amassed a, a big amount of money from pension funds and the like, and, and took all of the foreclosed properties off the books of the banks in the United States and became well, the biggest landlord in, 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 in the United States uh, almost immediately and has since done the same in, in Europe and so on, so that this is this is a, uh, an, a and again a, an amassing uh, of, uh, of of power, and I wanted to just make just one comment about uh, the political use of that power. I mean, in the United States, I think the situation has been for some time that the large corporations and the wealthy, what they look for in Congress is not something that is favorable uh, to them because they they they're doing well anyway. Uh, what they're looking for is something that, was, uh, uh, that makes Washington impossible, that Washington is in gridlock. They want the gridlock of, of the government, and that is what the Rep Republican Party is providing them with and why they are supporting the Republican Party, because they make it impossible for, for the state to actually do anything, because politically uh, the Republican Party can put a spanner in, that, in those works. So, so I think the, the, the takeover of land and, and, and land grabbing in Africa uh, by, by many of the foreign corporations and so on is a, is a real, real problem. And, and I, I don't know what the situation is in Colombia, but I suspect that uh, uh, there's a great deal of extractivism going on in terms of mineral resources and, and, and the like. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's, this, is, this is also another area where money is flowing. Money is flowing into, uh, not into produ producing anything, but it's, it, it, it's flowing into certain lines of, uh, of, of acquisition of assets. Uh, and it's everything from the art market to land, to property and, uh, and the like. And so that uh, the failure, if you like, of the, of the economy to continue to be as dynamic as it once was, has a lot to do with the channels uh, down which uh, surplus capital can flow into things like uh, land grabbing and land assets and, and how and speculating and, how, and property values and all the rest of it. And I would point out that 
you know, there've been many, many crises around since the 19, since 1980 in the capitalist world, and a good third of them have to do with property. So this is something that I, I think we should pay careful attention to. Thank you both. I'm going to do two more rounds of questions. Um, could we have Norma, please, then James, and then I'll take one from the chat. Uh, hi, <clears throat> thanks for the presentation. Um, I asked if there were any uh, effect of the idea of the dictatorship of the, pro of the proletariat in China, if uh, you have any impression about that. I also comment that I've been told that the billionaires don't run China. Uh, I've been told, uh, oh, my newspaper, my, my popular newspaper, which is, you know, uh, the, the uh, owner's newspaper, <clears throat> has reported that Xi has uh, explained that they are now in China going to move towards control of the economy uh, toward a uh, toward a continued development of communism. Uh, and there's devices to do, you probably mentioned them in your speeches, but uh, I'm not gonna try to go over that. Um, and the concern that the United States does not worry about armed conflict. Uh, for one thing, of course, the United States has bombed atom bombed the world since 1945, <clears throat> where it bombed the United States at uh, Alamogordo, and then bombed uh, under a democratic uh, government, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then continues testing everywhere. Uh, the United States is, uh, I, 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 you can't call it insane, but anyway, it's far enough away from what would develop as armed conflict, not to worry about uh, perpetrating it. Thanks, Norma. Um, can I just ask folk to try and be as succinct as possible? Because we do have a lot of, of questions. Um, James, could you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to, uh, so much to both of the speakers for two wonderful talks. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a point of emphasis, which is that I tend to see the 1990s and particularly the late 1990s as being the period of the maximum popular consent for neoliberalism, precisely insofar as the centre left and the mainstream articulations of the left had incorporated so much of the neoliberal agenda into their framework of modernisation. And that kind of brings me to, very briefly, the question of the last period that Costas called the interregnum, which has been dominated largely by the failure of neoliberalism on the one hand, and the success of the more right-wing forms of resistance uh, to that crisis on the other hand, as opposed to, well, it's not like the left didn't have its moments, as Costas will be in a position to speak about, I'm sure, with Syriza. But nonetheless, uh, where the left has had its moments, it hasn't been able to um, take advantage of them as well as others. And we're back to a situation where it seems we're in the old dynamic between the centre and the right wing. So I'm wondering what it will take for the idea of an anti-systemic left to be able to, um, as it were, take advantage of this coming period of post-neoliberalism in a way that it wasn't able to take advantage of the neoliberal interregnum. Thanks, James. I'll just let David and Costas note that down. Um, and then we've got from the chat, Pablo, who says, short question for you both. What do you understand as the end of neoliberalism? What would that look like to open it up again? Um, Costas, I'll hand it over to you. Um. I just want to make a point clear about pension funds and index funds and so on, because people have been interested in this. Just want to make something clear. When I, when I talk about asset managers, I don't mean pension funds here. I mean things like the big, uh, the big investment funds and uh, the big mutual funds and hedge funds and so on. Uh, basically, these people gather money from pension funds. 
governments and from insurance companies and from um, rich people and from anybody else. Uh, and it is these people that are the shadow system uh, that I was uh, referring to previously. And that's really the dynamic, incredible development of the last 20 years. They've been here with us. They've been, for a, here, they've been with us for a while. They were instrumental in a certain way to the crisis 2007, 2009. But by God, have they increased in presence and power and in terms of concentration. Now, the, the point I want to stress here, and I want to say, say it again, people think often finance, rise of finance, and finance tells uh, industrial capitalists what to do uh, and dominates industrial capitalists. Not quite. That's not how it is. Uh, that's not financialization. That's not what we're living through. That might have been the world of Hilferding. It might have been the world of Lenin 100 years ago. That's not the world of today particularly when it comes to these big uh, funds that I mentioned, the index funds and so on, the huge funds that have so much ownership. It's, it's remarkable how they operate. For them, at the moment, they, they, they choose not to apply that power. Uh, they're basically passive, even in terms of their policy, their index tracking. They're simply making this, they're, they're a kind of rentier almost. Not quite a rentier in the classic sense, but a kind of rentier. Will they do so in the near future? If they do, then the United States will look very different to what it does now. Because uh, if these people develop uh, stock ownership of the order of 50%, you wait and see if they decide to exercise power. Will it happen? It's more complex than that. I just want to, um, uh, to ring the bell that you should be, uh, uh, you should be looking for that. Now, um, dictatorship of the proletariat in China, well, be a nice idea. Um, all I can say about the Chinese regime is that it doesn't work like Western capitalism, for sure. And uh, it has elements of uh, state intervention, it has elements of um, state presence, and it has elements of ideology which come from the revolution, which make things very different. And that have, these elements have to do with um, the standing of China globally. China is not Japan, and China is not Germany. It will not operate that way. And the United States has begun to realize it. And that isn't simply the power of the Chinese economy. It's also the way the Chinese Communist Party uh, understands itself and the way it has shaped the Chinese society such as it is. So we've got the kind of capitalism, for sure. The economy operates capitalistically, um, but not in the way of the West. And it will not become like the, the West. Even financialization in China is not, there's no financialization the way we mean it in, uh, in, 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 in the West. Uh, in China. Now, last question I want to take on is what James asked about um, an anti-systemic left. And that to me is connected to the end of neo neoliberalism and what it might mean. At times I do think, you know, like Strake said, it's easier to think for many people to think of the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, and it's true. It's true. Um, so what would the end of neoliberalism mean in this context? How can we understand it differently? I did indicate we should expect to see changes in property rights. We should expect to see changes in the balance of power between workers and uh, capital, which are institutionally entrenched and they're in favor of workers. We should expect to see programs of public investment that are substantial and change the balance uh, of investment within particular countries. These things would begin to signal uh, indeed an end and an exit from neoliberalism uh, if accompanied by the right uh, political change. And that's where things become difficult because indeed this is an interregnum. This is an interregnum. It began with the great crisis. Uh, liberalism, not just, not just neoliberalism, but Western liberalism as a political agenda is, is bankrupt. It's obvious. It's exhausted. It's got new, no new ideas. It, it is actually discredited in the eyes of the many and certainly in the eyes of working people. Um, so that's clear. And it's got very little to offer. Populism talks a lot. And actually, when it comes down to it, it doesn't have anything new to offer. And you can see it in the case of Trump, which was just another version of neoliberalism, but also in Italy. Where is the great Salvini, the, the populist who was going to do this, that, and the other? In the, the man who was, you know, the, the, the wild card, a pussycat, a right pussycat the, in, in practice. So the new has got difficulty being born. Why? 
many reasons to do with ideology and so on. The weakness of workers after 40 years of, of um, sustained attack, but also the left. And that's the truth of it. We've become detached from working people. Uh, the left has become detached from working people. It's not really, it's not really a, 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 an organ, a, a, a set of organizations and so on, which, which actually is part and parcel of the working class. The left might have been weak in the past, but it was always of the working class uh, in an integral way. Today, it's not the case. It's not the case. And you see it up and down uh, the developed world. So until that is reestablished, until the left somehow recreates the connection with working people, until the left begins to populate itself with different cadres, different people who understand what the class issues are, until the left acquires a different set of concerns and approaches working people in language they understand, there's not going to be uh, an anti-systemic uh, response. These don't come from, don't fall from the sky. Someone's got to, do, someone's got to create it. And unfortunately, I don't see it. I don't see it. I see attempts. I see some of these people are here among us, right, who are trying their best. But we are few. We are few. And uh, when you look at the larger groups of the left, that's not how it is. Uh, they don't look like the working class. They don't speak like the working class. They don't act, they don't, they don't smell like the working class, you know, and that's not a good idea. Uh, if you want to, if you want a, a true anti-systemic um, uh, uh, option against neoliberalism, so. Thank you, Costas. Um, David, over to you. Uh, yeah, let me just go back a moment to the first question. There's a lot of uh, unrest in China uh, uh, from everything that I can gather. It's very difficult to keep tabs on it, as I understand. And you, know, you hear about strikes well after they've occurred, but there is a, a tremendous vitality in the, uh, in, the, the social, in the body politic, if you want to call it that, of uh, all kinds of forms of protest. But one of the things that the Chinese have done is that they, you know, we have an image that somehow or other it's a, a, a centralized, uh, thoroughly centralized economy. But in fact, the Chinese economy and, and politically is also highly decentralized. So almost all of these protests are against local governments and so on. And so the central committee rarely experiences any direct protest against it. All of the protest is about regional government, a mayor or, or and, and, and so on. So that China, you have to understand the Chinese economy is not purely centralized. It, is, it, has a, it has a centralized core, but it is extremely decentralized at all other levels. And therefore, a large amount of protest can be sort of, uh, as long as it stays local, uh, the, the, the central committee is kind of protected. So, it, so the level of local protest is very, very, very high. But what are these protests about? Well, there have been protests about labor conditions. Uh, and uh, now the government has moved to regulate labor conditions. They had this uh, uh, system which was, uh, which was well, the protests within, within the, the artificial intelligence uh, sector. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, six days a week, uh, uh, nine, uh, from, nine, from nine to six, six days a week. And there's a movement around that. The government has now banned that. So they're intervening in labor markets right now to sort of, sort of deal with the base of the unrest. They're also looking about, and the last statements of Xi were, that they have three mountains to climb in order to make themselves closer to socialism. And the three mountains are adequate health care for everybody, adequate educational opportunity for everybody, and they abolished private tuition uh, systems, which had grown up and about 100,000 people were put out of work immediately by uh, that abolition. But it's uh, to, to make uh, access to education much more equitable and access to uh, affordable housing. Now, frankly, if you ask me about systemic left and all the rest of it, well, I can have wonderful thoughts about that, but wouldn't it be enough that we actually at this time said to ourselves that we have three mountains to climb on the left. And these three mountains, sorry, there's an election on today in New York City and people are yelling in the street and honking horns. Um, but if we could climb those three mountains, get adequate health care for everybody, adequate access to education for everybody, and adequate 
uh, uh, access to affordable housing. Because here we have this crazy system in New York, we're building stuff for the upper classes, for, for, for investment. We're, we're making an urbanization which is adequate for capital, but it's not an urbanization which is adequate for people. We have about half of the population of New York City cannot get adequate housing. There is not affordable housing for that for that population. These these are these are tangible targets, and I think the left, if they focus on those tangible targets, and I, and I kind of like the fact that Xi said those are okay. These are three targets we have in China. Well, maybe we should take them on here and say, all right, let's 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 really have a big fight over that, because that in itself would start to change the trajectory a little. But the other thing is this incredible concentration of wealth and power in the oligarchy that has to be dealt with and has to be confronted. Thanks, David. I know we've reached time, but I'm going to do another round of questions because um, we've just had so many. I do apologize to those who have put your well thought through questions in the chat and we haven't had a chance, but I'm sure you appreciate that it's the problems of having over 500 people join an event. Um, I'm going to start with Gregors, who says, if European fascism arose partly as a political solution to American Fordist productive advantage, what modifications are we likely to see in Western capitalist states in response to the competitive advantage occasioned by the character and capacity of the Chinese state? Secondly, we've got Mika, who asks, investments in the built environment that don't increase productivity seem to be necessary to not exceed ecological limits. What would Marx or you have to say about degrowth and achieving some kind of regenerative stasis that would be amenable to people's basic needs? How could this be a replacement to the neoliberal order? And then lastly, for Costas Ilan, who tried to ask you before and, and had some technical difficulties, what would you speculate about the relationship between market concentration and financialization? Costas, I'll come to you first, if that's okay. Um, let me start with the last question, which is more um, focused on uh, economics. Um, I want to point out that the more we talk the language of neoliberalism and globalization, because they went together, the more we witness the rise of monopoly and huge powers um, uh, of uh, corporates uh, across the world. Uh, it's actually interesting how, it went, how it's gone. Um, the concentration um, of um, uh, industrial, generally productive capital in the United States is enormous right now, and it's bigger than in Europe. Um, and the concentration of, um, of, uh, of power in finance is even greater. Uh, and, 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 and asset management finance is uh, uh, even greater. In other words, the centralization of capital that Marx talked about and the concentration of capital has proceeded apace throughout this period. The more that they talked about the market, the more that capital became bigger and bigger uh, 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 per, per unit. Um, what's interesting to observe here is that financialization domestically has gone with financialization internationally as this has happened. Um, and much of financialization internationally has been driven by capital exports. Uh, and that has gone together with the global spread of production and the global spread um, of finance. So capital centralization and concentration, market concentration and uh, centralization is integral to financialization. It, it is actually an important dimension of it. And it is also one key way in which um, the the foundations of financialization proceed. Because you see, when you think of financialization, you should always think in the first instance of non-financial corporations. That's where it starts, not with finance, but with non-financial corporations. In what way? Often people make the mistake of thinking that financialization happens at that, at that level because non-financial corporations choose to go into financial activities because they are more profitable than investment activities. This is the wrong thinking. Um, uh, uh, and it actually replicates the thinking of the portfolio manager. 
That's not how industrial capital works. Um, what happens there is that as monopolization proceeded and concentration increased, um, these enterprises found themselves in possession of substantial liquid funds, huge funds, which were temporarily idle, temporarily uh, uh, not used because the circuit of capital does that. And they became the source of um, investment in the repo market, not because, not because the rate of return was higher in the repo market, but because there was no use effectively in production. The opportunity cost was zero in production. Um, that has continued. That's what's behind it. I mean, you look at the repo market and the shadow, the shadow um, finance that I talk about, and huge corporations are the mainstay. The other element, of course, is uh, pension funds um, and uh, so on, gathering, gathering popular savings. Um, now, uh, the question about um, the question about uh, uh, the built the, the the growth of the built environment. Yeah, I am very suspicious of degrowth and arguments about degrowth. Um, I know people don't mean degrowth in the sense of stopping growth because they mean it in a transformative way when, when they, at least some people who come from the left mean it in that way. But I'll tell you, we've had degrowth in Greece for about 10 years, um, capitalistic degrowth, but degrowth nonetheless. It's not a pretty sight, I can tell you, um, when that happens. So um, I prefer to think that society can reorganize itself, um, that uh, we, can have, uh, uh, we can have a set of social, uh, socially based principles on, uh, on which we can reorganize our, our productive activities in ways that are compatible with nature, without invading nature, without raping nature, without treating nature as a, as a foreign country. I believe that it is perfectly possible. Uh, do, perfectly. I believe that it is possible to do that, but it would require social change. Um, it, would, it would require social transformation. Quite how we do it is a matter of debate. And that's what we should be debating. We should move away from the old ideas uh, of socialists on this, and we should discuss it in a fresh way. There are plenty of ways of doing, doing it, which are not really the growth, uh, of which I repeat, I'm very suspicious. Last thing is about fascism. I'll tell you, um, for the first time in a long time, I genuinely think that um, the threat of fascism in Europe is a real thing, um, particularly in Europe, because um, everything else has been tried. Uh, the European Union is not going anywhere. Um, liberalism is bankrupt. Populism hasn't worked. Uh, if what they're trying at the moment with the increase in money supply, the provision of credit, the, 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 the credit bubble that has emerged, and the support of, of, of aggregate demand that has sustained uh, uh, employment and so on. If that doesn't work in the medium term, and there are serious reasons to think that it will not work, um, politically, there'll be a little left, but some form of fascism. Uh, it won't have a mustache, you know, and it won't, it won't do the whole Hitler business, but it will be fascism, right? Um, and, uh, uh, because, because vast numbers of people, working people and elsewhere in Europe are completely disillusioned and alienated from the current political um, system. They, they detest it. Um, and much of the thinking is pivots on anti-immigration arguments, racist arguments and so on, which can be um, manipulated by fascists. Um, what form that will take economically is difficult to tell whether it will be a return to corporatism, it's difficult to tell. But you will definitely have ideas of, of uh, some kind of sovereignty associated with it and being against uh, internationalism and globalization. Um, we're some way from that, I have to say. I don't want anyone to leave here thinking that I'm saying that next year we're gonna have fascism in Europe. We're some way from that. But I want to, to stress that for the first time in a long time, given how neoliberalism is performing, given the, the, the state of financialization, yes, there is a risk. There is a risk that serious uh, fascist forces will begin to emerge uh, in Europe if the current situation uh, goes pear-shaped again pretty soon, which it might do. Thanks, Costas. David, what's your um, response to also what Costas was saying yeah. and uh, on the concept of degrowth? Well, here's the, the situation as I see it. Um, 
the the total global economy and was in constant dollars was around in 1960 or so it was around nine trillion dollars it's now 90 trillion dollars it's a tenfold increase over you know 50 years uh, and and i think that that what we're looking at is the problem of of, of, of hyper growth in and the result is there's a lot of this excess liquidity sloshing around not knowing what to do and therefore there are all kinds of crazy things going on the crazy urbanization projects which are going on which are just spectacle uh, and, and so on the selling of experience rather than of things through the society of the spectacle becoming everywhere so the all sorts of things like that are going on but that has a lot to do with the fact that you've got to find investment opportunities for 90 trillion dollars now if you multiply that by 10 over the next 40 50 years you're talking about 900 trillion dollars and uh, you know the excess is just going to go crazy so at some point or other you cannot continue on this exponential growth path you're going to have to stop so whether you're talking about degrowth as a constant it, it, it's it's going to come a, come to a, to a halt and a grinding halt and maybe the climate thing is one of them now i made a lot of emphasis upon china saving global capitalism which it did but it did so at a cost china's grow uh, greenhouse emissions shot up like crazy during this period and just to give you an example again it's the scale of the whole thing that that is that is, that is astonishing china in two years consumed 145 percent of this uh, uh, as much cement as the, as the united states consumed in 100 years and in two years now you cement everywhere put cement around to begin with the production of cement produces a lot of greenhouse gases in itself secondly you're you're putting cement everywhere around the place you look at those all of those uh, apartments and it's cement 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 and 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 so so in a way china saved global capitalism at the expense of the environment and so something has to be has to give here and and you cannot imagine doing this in a way which is very democratic i mean garrett hardin a long time ago sort of said in his you know tragedy of the, uh, of the commons that there was no real democratic way in which you were going to solve some of these problems and therefore you need some sort of authority and some uh, dare i say it, authoritarianism in order to be able to curb the kind of craziness that is going on of people thinking they can gain an exponential growth forever when when in fact uh, the, the the environmental conditions and the social conditions and even the economic conditions in terms of what the hell are you going to do with all that surplus capital that's sloshing around with corporations and so on and 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 this so this is this is if you like the the, the existential dilemma that we face right now and i think that from that standpoint there has to be some way of, uh, of, of, of dealing with this question of the eco ecological question and you know people shy away and say well this is being Malthusian or something like that well it's not being Malthusian it's just looking at the 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 the, the, the metabolic relation we have with the uh, with, with nature and 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 saying that it this is something which is which is which is going to kick up and is kicking up in all these directions so i don't even see the pandemic as being somehow or other outside of the totality of capitalist social relations it's a typical product of of the concentration of uh, of, of, of economic activity monocultures and all the rest of it and if the bats can't you know live their lives in the way they want to live them they're going to go off and infect something else and, and viruses are going to be all over the place so so we're running in if, if there's any danger right now it's the danger of, of incoherence in relationship to this existential threat now when you say it's an existential threat people kind of go get like it's panic stations i don't think it has to be panic stations it just has to be measured political uh uh interventions but this is where we get i get back to the fact that the measured political in interventions are impossible in the united states because big capital and the oligarchy is making absolutely sure that there cannot be a, 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 an active government it wants gridlock it wants gridlock and it wants it at every level uh, we're now hearing stories like the Koch brothers, who's one of the people who invest in all these kinds of things, is supporting anti-mask protest school board meetings and terrorizing people 
and and is, is using school boards as 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 a way of kind of uh, fostering the Trump thing. I mentioned Blackstone and all these people. They all contribute to Donald Trump. They really do. Why? Because they believe what he's doing is good. No, but because he offers them gridlock. That's what they want. And that is going to be, I think, the biggest danger right now, that the left is not able to organize, the right is, 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 is getting organized. So that gets back to the notion of that's probably where the gridlock is going to come from. I don't think it's going to succeed in this country in creating something like a fascist thing. And, and this, but at the same time, there is uh, this, this existential danger that here we face uh, climate change problems, uh, which, which have to be addressed, but which we cannot address because we cannot possibly create a political climate in which we can sit around and work out the, the, the details. Thanks, David. And thanks, Costas. And think on that, we'll, we'll round up. It was fantastic hearing you both. Um, we were very, very privileged to have you both speaking with us, taking the time. So a massive thank you from myself, Contour, everybody here, um, the Havens Right Centre. I also want to thank all of you guys for coming. It's been a fantastically international audience, which has been such a pleasure. Um, I'm really sorry again for those of you who put great questions in, but we just didn't have the time, um, unfortunately. Um, so thanks again to the Havens Right Centre who have co-hosted this. And I want to remind everyone to visit their website, Contour's website, register for the next lectures and join our mailing list. And most importantly, support the Glasgow strikes that are happening now as the COP26 negotiations take place, right? It's about the working class at the end of the day. So thank you all. Massive round of applause for everybody, especially the speakers. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, wherever you are, and a lovely evening if you're in the UK. Until we meet again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye to all. Bye.